the reality of having livestock is you are changing the balance of nature in a way to maintain these animals for your own purpose. We've got quite a bit of snow today compared to what we had yesterday, which was none. And uh, here's our flock of American buff geese kind of out enjoying it, for lack of a better term. Uh, our flock is made up of different individuals from different sources, so we've got quite a bit of genetic diversity here, i.e. these birds are not all related. Now, I will say right off the bat, as we watch these geese, we have about four more than what we need going into the winter, i.e. we have four that we want to process. But the rest of these birds are going to stay with us through the winter uh, till the spring, because we're going to try to get some younger ones paired off, and uh, hopefully we'll get at least three pairs out of this uh, for next year's sort of breeding season. Now, this looks like a lot of birds, a lot of big birds, a lot of mouths to feed, and difficulties to uh, to keep them over the winter. And all of that's 100% true. The reality of having livestock is you are changing the balance of nature in a way to maintain these animals for your own purpose. And plants, it's the same thing. Uh, to, to the ultimate end of you are eating them. But in nature, it wouldn't function the way we build a homestead i.e. a lot of the well, geese in particular are a great example they likely wouldn't stay for the winter <laughs> given the opportunity so that is one sort of dilemma with with livestock on the homestead is you're making changes and with those kind of come some sacrifices i suppose with them in the background here one of the i guess the real core of this this discussion video today and we'll show you some other examples of what we do and why we do it on at least a high level point of view is this notion of populations and uh, I think modern homesteading is very different from historic homesteading or go back further than homesteading because yes that's based on the homestead act and this that and whatever but really growing food <laughs> uh, to feed yourself in modern times is, is quite a bit different because we have access to tons of subsidies and one of those subsidies is hypothetically you can always get more and all, it's kind of a, a bigger symptom of consumerism but on the homestead scale now it's very very difficult in my opinion to completely remove yourself from being a consumer i.e there's always going to be something that you can't produce yourself or can't maintain yourself or can't grow yourself that's not the purpose of this video not i'm not trying to make it sound like everybody has to be perfect what i'm trying to stress here is Right now, I think everybody can agree the one thing that is certain about our human environment is uncertainty. So, if you go back to the notion of a sustainable homestead, the point of that is to sustainably feed yourself or provide other products, i.e. fiber, etc. That can all be part of it too. And y y there's an implied level of, of independence there. And I think the, the take home message here is you're trying to find ways to reduce your dependency. So maintaining populations of something like our geese or our chickens or our sheep or whatever it is in the long term is beneficial. But as I just said, you do have sacrifices because you have to feed them and you have to maintain them. But with that, I think there's some deeper uh, theory here of our interconnected relationship, which takes you well beyond the quote-unquote put-and-take uh, scenario, i.e. that you can always purchase more, there, there's always more, I don't want to raise it out over the winter because I can just get more in the spring. Uh, that's been a common thing for quite a few generations now, but you're essentially continually dependent on acquiring those things. As we change some scenery to some Icelandic sheep in the snow, I think this is a good example for us where in maintaining a population, we keep and use a lot more male animals with the point of maintaining some genetic diversity, i.e. we don't want everybody to be related to the same dad. That's kind of contrary to a lot of advice because, as you can see here, everybody's eating. And male animals are usually considered to be a bit of a drain because they're eating just as much in a lot of cases as the females. Maybe not at, like, peak lambing time, etc. But 
So from a quote-unquote economic perspective, there's a bit of a loss there because maximizing the number of females that you can breed to a male uh, reduce, in theory reduces your cost. But this is where the paradigm changes when you're talking about maintaining populations. Because it's not just about economics in the sense of how much money am I making versus how much money am I spending. It's what's the long-term vision or goal here. Uh, it's really short-sighted to say, I'm going to say it in this way, to try to say you're sustain sustainable and only use one ram because all of the offspring are going to be related. Now, there's lots of discussions on inbreeding, but there's not a lot of longevity there without bringing new genetics in. And not everything is going to ever be completely isolated, but you have a buffer. That's that's the big piece here. And obviously, sheep are not one of those things that are super easy to just pick up in the spring to raise out for the year. Can you do it? Absolutely. But uh, sheep usually fall into that category of, if you're going to get into it, uh, you kind of end up having to maintain a population because the reality of it is in most areas, at least in Canada, they're not um, abundant mainstream livestock, i.e. there isn't a big sheep industry relative to other animals. And then we have chickens. You can see these young partridge chanticleers out foraging in the snow, which is actually quite funny. Chickens are, I'm going to say it, often kind of a disposable livestock in a way. Super productive, super ubiquitous, and uh, probably if I had to pick one, notwithstanding restrictions on what you're allowed to keep, if I had to pick one animal, this is probably the one I would recommend to everybody for what it can do for you. And there's a long history of association with humans. But in modern times, uh, they've become a bit disposable because they're, they're readily available from large companies for lack of a better way to put it, you can buy chicks every spring. Now, there have been times when, uh, in recent history, where chicks weren't available. It's like raising broilers. You have them for a while, you have them to the end of raising them for meat, and then you don't have them anymore. The problem with that is it may seem economical or be beneficial from a work perspective, i.e. you've got less work over the course of the year, but, uh, there are some other issues with that. So what's the, so what is one of the biggest issues with the broiler chickens, for example, or hybrid layers? Hybrids in of themselves are not a negative. I'm going to clarify that right now. <clears throat> but the problem with hybrids is typically to get the results, i.e. the standard uh, Cornish cross results that everybody's come to know and expect in chicken, you have to maintain populations. Here's the key. You have to maintain populations of the parent breeds. And I don't necessarily mean like standard of perfection breeds. I'm just saying genetic lines uh, need to be maintained. And the big companies that produce broilers, they do that. And you're not hearing that side of the story. What you're hearing is raise this bird, you'll get X results in this amount of time. Obviously it's true, but there's your dilemma. You are, if, if you go with that model... You're 100% dependent on those companies to produce those animals because you cannot do it yourself to get those results. And so therefore, are you really sustainable? And that animal becomes nothing more than, than put and take. On the flip side, which is kind of the old-timey uh, old timey common folk way of doing it, is you maintain a population of chickens. And it doesn't matter the breed. It doesn't... Uh, it's, you know, unique to your situation. And rather than those animals being sort of universally standard across an entire North American or possibly global population, you have regional variation, which allows them to better cope with your uh, environment. And I say that loosely because there's lots of factors to that, but it's like those Charanticleurs that I just showed you. They're young and they're out in the snow. Would a, would a uh, production broiler be able to do that? Probably not. Is it ideal? Also probably not. But uh, it does. it is a bit of a testament to the hardiness there. On the flip side of that, this is not a breed that you can simply just purchase every spring as a put and take. So if you're going to keep these, I say rare, heritage, uh, historic, old-timey, pick a, pick a term. It doesn't really matter. You can argue the semantics. But if you're picking these animals, you're pretty much bound, in a way, 
to maintain a population or else you won't uh, you won't continue to get whatever benefit that it is that you uh, you began keeping them for in the first place if you don't so as we come back to the geese and kind of in closing on this video the other part of maintaining these populations as it relates to sustainability is you end up and this is going to be a bit abstract sounding but you end up realistically in a relationship with the animals that you're keeping that sounds kind of wishy-washy kind of funny at face value but it's basically true you are maintaining them for your benefit but at the same time by maintaining populations they are also benefiting because the sad fact is a lot of these breeds species in some cases have fallen out of favor because they lack the economic i.e the money making production qualities that can be scaled up but that's exactly what makes them unique but also perfectly adapted and why they exist in the first place why there are so many different kinds and geese are maybe a bad example there's not as many kinds of them but why are there so many kinds of rabbits so many kinds of chickens so many kinds of cattle so many kinds of goats they're all adapted for slightly different things they all have slightly different production qualities that makes them unique that makes them worthwhile and up until recently i'm going to not date it but we're just going to say recently all of us anywhere in the planet have had relationships with these animals maybe not directly each species but every culture across the planet has relationships with domestic semi-domestic and wild animals um and that's one piece that's sort of getting broken in modern times because <clears throat> most of these animals are looked at simply in their unit value, i.e. these geese sitting here have no other value in an economic sense than their weight in meat. But in being human and uh, experiencing the human experience, for lack of a better way to put it, there's a lot more sitting there in the snow in terms of how these animals have uh, and this is just one silly little example of how animals how plants have basically shaped us as a species and allowed us to live all across the planet and how in a truly sustainable model it's not about the poundage I think that's important because we need to eat a certain amount but it's not all about the poundage of meat or milk or fiber or draft power or whatever that these organisms produce for you um, as they all walk away <laughs> but as you can see here as the geese all got up and walked away from me you you have a relationship with them because they're providing us with a service and a nutrient cycle if it were um, without maybe knowing it but we're also ensuring their continued existence so it's mutual we just don't always think of it in that terms so on that note with the sheep in the background um as we are getting ready to end one year which has had its share of unpredictability and uncertainty and we're moving into a new year i basically kind of am urging people to to look at their homestead or the way they're growing food uh look at the animals and plants that you're grow you're raising right? growing that you're feeding yourself with and and think about the relationships that you actually have with them because it's something that gets overlooked because of the the more flashy economic return i'm going to say it that way uh, and we're, we're all kind of programmed to look at things that way i mean we did it ourselves look at us with the cows what was one of the biggest reasons, not the only, but one of the big reasons for switching to cows over goats was that incentive of maybe we could actually make some money with them. But the reality of it is uh, when things are uncertain, saving money is far more important and having these kind of interconnected relationships. And I'm not going to say it's not, it's, it's thought out. I mean, just because we're focusing on geese as they make some noise in the background doesn't mean geese are for everybody's homestead. So you have to decide what's, what's most beneficial, valuable for your homestead, your situation. But uh, you're also looking at how are these relationships saving you money? I mean, economics, we're going to do this in a bit more detail, but 
economics are really a substitute for resources, right? If you have enough money, you have enough resources to throw whatever you want at something, you can make anything happen. But uh, so that money is still substituting for time, labor, effort, etc. Somewhere in the world. Uh, you know, you're paying so that you don't have to spend your time growing geese, for example. But uh, maybe more of us should grow geese. And uh, anyways, leave us your thoughts. Definitely interested to hear it. This is probably something that will feed into some roundtable discussions in the new year. But uh, yeah, is it time to start looking at homesteads more as uh, interconnected populations in a more like ecology and less in terms of how much production we're getting as a measure of success.